continue with HRL. Uh, Nathan Holman is the next speaker. Um, yeah, so my name is Nathan Holman. I'm a research scientist at HRL Laboratories, and today I'm going to talk to you about encoded qubits in silicon um, and why we think they're a, you know, a highly performant and scalable platform for quantum computing. Um, so I think you know, on Friday we heard at the panel there's kind of three takeaways. Uh, one, quantum computers have real promise to solve certain kinds of problems that are computationally complex for classical computers. Um, two, no modern, you know, current quantum computer actually does any useful work. And, and three, there's going to need to be a lot of investment um, to actually achieve quantum computing. I think Will Oliver said a trillion dollars, maybe globally, and who knows how many decades that's going to actually take. And right now, we're kind of in a hype, hype echo chamber uh, for quantum computing. And really, you have to remember, we're a long way from utility. Um, and so, uh, you know, HRL is kind of unique in the ecosystem of uh, quantum computing companies. Uh, we're a non-commercial, non-academic, advanced technology research laboratory. Um, so we have you know, industry-like resources. We have our own clean room to fabricate our devices. Um, but we don't have to sell anything. So we don't have to produce like a cloud-based quantum computer to sell time on this year, next year, or 10 years from now. Um, and really, that's because we have a variety of um, contracts, both with the government and other commercial entities, to basically determine you know, the viability of the technology that we study. Um, yeah. So what do we actually study? Uh, we study a thing called the exchange-only qubit. It's a type of a qubit that is called sometimes an encoded qubit or a decoherence-free subsystem. What that really means is we take a collection of quantum objects, in our case, three electron spins, and encode an effective two-level system out of it. Um, and the way we actually make a three electron spins into a two-level system is we take one pair of them, say the ones under P2 and P1 here, and it initialize that as a spin singlet, giving us a total spin one half in this three spin subspace. Um, and we isolate each of those spins in a unique spatial location that we call quantum dots, um, which are illustrated here in the bottom of the panel. And we're able to manipulate interactions between those spins by changing the barriers between them, by uh, effectively changing voltages on these gates that are labeled x1 and x2. And those drive rotations in the block sphere for our qubit. Um, another thing that's kind of unique about our qubit is when we aren't driving rotations, our qubit's state vector actually stays pointed at the point on the block sphere that you left it. It doesn't rotate at 18 gigahertz or whatever your qubit frequency is, because our qubit states are degenerate. Um, so that's a pretty unique feature of our devices. Um, and really, this one interaction exchange is the only one we need for measurement, preparation, and cu qubit control. And so we really have to just master one thing to do anywhere from one to n qubits. And that's kind of another advantage of this kind of architecture. Um, so I'm going to dive into a little bit about what exchange actually is. Um, it's a fundamentally a, a consequence of the fact that we use fermions. Um, and so the overall fermionic wave function has to be anti-symmetric. And so you can kind of break that up into the, the spatial component, so like the charge-like component, and then the spin-like component. And so if you have two spins, um, right, you have either like singlet states or triplet states. Singlets are anti-symmetric fundamentally. Um, and so what that means is we can actually uh, infer things like the spin state uh, by uh, changing the spatial state of our, our, where our electrons actually are. So in the middle of this plot on the bottom here, uh, we have our two spins distributed between two quantum dots, and they're de nearly degenerate with the triplet states. But when we tilt the well and try to put our two charges into one quantum dot or the other, uh, what you can see is the singlet can readily do that, but the triplet can't. The triplet energy remains high. 
Um, and we actually use that feature to do state discrimination. We basically measure whether or not we can put two charges into one quantum dot or not. Okay, and uh, you know, exchange um, on this energy diagram is essentially just the energy difference between these two things. So by opening and closing the energy gap, right, we can write down uh, you know, our unitary time evolution and it's essentially based on whatever the eigenvalues happen to be. Um, and that's how we drive our block sphere rotations. We basically turn on some finite amount of exchange for some time and then turn it off. Okay, so I'm an experimentalist, so I like to know what things look like, uh, actually. Um, so what we use is called the sledge device. It's a single layer etch-defined gate electrode uh, architecture. And so this top image here is an SEM of the gate metal after we've done the deposition, patterning, and etching using EVM lithography. And so on the top row there, you can see there are six, uh, six gates that are labeled as P1 through P6. Those are where our quantum dots live underneath. Um, and we have a cross section here that you can see uh, schematically where we want to try to accumulate our, our spins um, in this uh, narrow gray region that's known as the silicon quantum well. Um, there's some additional details about these devices. Uh, I think the most important one is that we have to enrich the silicon, um, remove some of those nuclear spins that are naturally uh, occurring. And in, in, if you just take like a random amount of silicon, right, there's some amount of it has silicon 29, which has spinful nuclei, and those would def deface our qubits. So by removing those, we can enhance our coherence properties. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you, and, and, and the other thing that's important to note here is that we, uh, we have a tr kind of a truly CMOS-like technology. So we pattern all these gate, gate electrodes, we via down from above to bring in our wire, control wiring on the chip. Um, and so we can really leverage this to build things like 2D arrays. And we have drawings um, that are gonna be published pretty soon on how you might extend this to like a, a six by six quantum dot array. Um, and underneath, right, each of these P gates, we wanna accumulate our electrons and have our qubits. Okay, so how do we actually manipulate these things? We just apply voltage pulses. Um, kind of in the ideal limit, they look like square waves. Uh, and, and, and for our control pulses, they're pretty narrow in time, like 10, 10 nanoseconds. And the height of these pulses is relatively modest, something like 100 millivolts on chip. Uh, and, and that's able to turn on exchange from essentially below 10 kilohertz, nearly zero, uh, to hundreds of megahertz and beyond. Um, we've demonstrated exchange energies as high as uh, 18 gigahertz, uh, and that essentially sets the gate speed. Um, for practical reasons, our gate speeds are, we typically open our exchanges to around 100 megahertz uh, just due to the bandwidth of our, our analog electronics. Um, and ultimately what you care about is the area under this curve, that defines the rotation angle in the block sphere for us. Um, you do have to pad uh, between pulses some amount of time to allow the pulses to ring down because of the finite bandwidth. Um, uh, and, and in practice, uh, we use kind of low time resolution, but high uh, voltage resolution to, to define all the angles we need to say do benchmarking experiments. Um, our measurements, however, are actually quite long by comparison. They're order of microseconds to tens of microseconds. And so uh, you need to be able to apply these pul voltage pulses levels kind of accurately over many different time scales. And so one thing that's kind of unique about HRL is that not only do we build the quantum devices, but we build our own electronic hardware to, to kind of meet the requirements that those devices give us. Um, so uh, we use these things called high-speed adders to actually achieve you know, wide time dynamic range uh, in our pulses um, without some of the drooping effects that you get if you just use a bias T. Uh, and and if, you want to re if you're interested in like electrical engineering aspects of this, this, this paper explains it in some, quite some detail. Um, okay, so how do we actually measure our charge states? Um, so if you have like two electrons under say P1 and P2, uh, what you might want to do is uh, you know, actually detect whether or not like you have, have the charges there in the first place. Um, and so what we do is we build a second quantum dot that's parallel to our qubit channel. And we call that a dot charge sensing, uh, uh, dot charge sensor. And so that thing is capacitively coupled to our qubit uh, electrons. And, and uh, what we do is we flow current through our dot sensor and measure the current. Um, and when charges move around, they affect essentially how much current can flow through that, that channel. Uh, and so by measuring the current, we can infer the charge state of our qubits with pretty, pretty good accuracy. Um, so here's an example of a charge stability diagram where we sweep the voltages on P1 and P2, 
and change the number of electrons that are in our quantum dots. And so just by looking at this kind of idyllic charge stability diagram, you can very easily as a human read off like how many lines did I cross? That's how many charges you have. Um, of course, in reality, right, uh, if we're gonna build a large computer, we're gonna have to automate this. And so one thing um, that we do have going on kind of as an active area of research at HRL is, is automating all of the tuning. Um, it might be possible for a human to tune up one cub two qubit device by hand, um, but if you have a million <laughs> qubits or something, that's not gonna fly, right? Like no one's gonna sit around and do that. Um, and so what we've done is we've trained a convolutional neural network to actually do a lot of this analysis, find the key points in our plots, uh, and actually set voltages and get the right charge states for our qubits. Um, so you know, putting an electron under each, each of those P gates. Um, but this is an active area of research, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely uh, looking for people who are interested in this sort of thing to come work for us. Um, okay, so we have these sledge devices. How do they actually look when you characterize them? Well, all the charge stability diagrams are relatively uniform, which is kind of a key feature of this technology that uh, HRL invented. Um, we're able to readily, uh, in these devices, measure essentially voltage to exchange energy maps. Uh, we call them fingerprints uh, for historical reasons. Um, but then you might ask, like, okay, how coherent is this thing really? Um, and so for spins, one thing you might care about is the magnetic dephasing time. Uh, in this particular device, it's about three and a half microseconds, which doesn't sound super good, but actually uh, it's completely understood by the amount of residual nuclear spins that are in the device. Um, and even if you can't purify better, you can do dynamical decoupling schemes. Um, in the lab, we've demonstrated up to like 700 microseconds of T2 coherence when you dynamically decouple. And remember, our gate times are 10 nanoseconds, so that's huge, right? Um, the other thing uh, that you might care about is how coherent is it under driven evolution? So here uh, you can see all the ex driven uh, exchange oscillations. The quality factor is around 55 for these. Um, and that's readily improved also by just going faster. Uh, and really we can feed uh, all of these kind of characterization metrics into a model for our randomized benchmarking error and really understand our gate error. Um, so really all of this is just limited by basically these two things. Um, and we kind of know how to improve them, so that, that's, that's good to know. Okay, so why go through kind of all this complicated fab and hardware buildup? Um, it's really because we care about building a fault-tolerant quantum computer, and we're trying to evaluate whether or not you know, semiconductor spins are good for that. Um, so our qubits, we're able to do state prep and measurement with really competitive state-of-the-art fidelities, 99.7% demonstrated in this paper by my colleague J Jacob Blumoff. Um, as well as single qubit gate fidelities at 99.9, which is you know, comparable to a lot of superconducting qubit technologies. And remember, this is, a, you know, this is a nanoelectronic device, so we can really pack in a lot of qubits in a small space. Um, a few hundred nanometers across for two qubits. You know, in a few micron square area, you're talking many tens of qubits as opposed to needing like a centimeter size chip uh, for uh, other technologies. Um, and really, we believe these errors are gonna be well-behaved uh, because of the fact that exchange is exponential in voltage. Um, our crosstalk is generally gonna be quite low, also because we route out our uh, wiring on a different layer that also helps suppress that crosstalk. Um, and really, the other important thing is that we can uh, theoretically design our, our gates to be you know, dynamically decoupling and this sort of thing. Um, that makes them error-resistant in the end, and that's important. So, uh, okay, so we have this nice like, little animation uh, John Carpenter made that tries to illustrate how our devices look. So here are the gate electrodes. That's that single layer on the semiconductor surface that we fab. And then the vias come up, attached to the back end routing, and they're sitting on top of a, a gate dielectric that you can't see here. Okay, so we can go to the cross section of the device. Again, you can see the gate electrodes on the semiconductor surface, the vias that come in from above, and the quantum well. Going back to the animation, you can see here, there's one of our qubits in this two qubit array, and the blue things here are voltage pulses coming down the gates. Those do the manipulations between the spins, and uh, this diagram in particular uh, is actually a C naught being played out on the quantum computer. Um, and uh, you know, uh, for this particular you know target and control qubit, uh, and you know, designing these kind of braiding diagrams is is another thing that we really care about at HRL. 
Okay, so I said that was a C naught, but how do you actually know? Um, you want to verify the function of the gate, right? So here is you know all the angles you have to calibrate in order to actually play the C naught. Um, that's derived theoretically uh, and or uh, by brute computational search. Um, experimentalist has to actually do it. Okay, so here are all the voltages you have to throw at the particular times in the sequence. That's a little challenging, but it's doable. Um, you just have to calibrate your exchange to voltage maps again. And so what you can do is, you know, initialize your qubit in a variety of states and then look at the output after you play the C naught. And uh, sure enough, our experimental tomogram here is in the lower left, and then the theoretical one is in the right, and they resemble each other pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clearly. Um, another type of two-qubit gate you might care about is just swapping your qubits. That's important for data transfer in an array, right? If I have some bit of information over in one cluster of the device and I need to move it somewhere else, you've got to swap. Swapping is, natively, uh, is native in our devices, so a pi pulse on any of our exchange gates swaps two spins. So left goes to right, right goes to left. And here again, the process tomogram looks like the theoretical one. Now you may notice, right, there's some noise in those tomograms, and it's actually kind of a consequence of what tomograms do. They're really sensitive to the spam errors. This particular device has an issue with the state measurement on uh, one of the two measure dots that we use. So that's kind of why it's noisy. And really, tomography is not a good way to measure gate fidelity. And that's ultimately what you care about, is how good are the gates, not necessarily how good is the measurement. That, that, that's something you try to solve as a separate entity. Okay, so how do you actually do that? You do this two-qubit two randomized benchmarking. Um, basically, it's, uh, you're gonna play in a, a random sequence of these, uh, what are called two-qubit Cliffords. Um, there's a lot of them, and when, when you write it down, there's 11,520 of these things. And rather than optimizing each one of them, we decompose them in terms of single qubit Cliffords, uh, swap gates, and C naughts. Um, and on average, uh, in our technology, it, it, that's 41 exchange pulses per, per two qubit Clifford gate. So it's a lot of pulses, right? Um, so when we do this and vary the number of you know, sequences we play and their length, uh, what we find is an average two qubit Clifford error of about 3% in this device. Um, and that can, you know, if you want to think of it in terms of per uh, control manipulation, it's like 0.07% error per pulse. Um, and this is like competitive with other spin, spin encodings, uh, like single spin manipulation. Okay, uh, so if you want to know the error rate of a particular gate, what you can do is take that random sequence and interleave a gate of your choice um, and, 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 and measure the error rate associated with just that gate. Um, so here for our C naught, uh, we see it's a little above the average two qubit Clifford. It's at 3.7%. Um, our swap is basically at the measurement threshold, right? The uncertainty of this measurement. Okay, it says it's 0.7% error, but it's a plus or minus half a percent. So it's, you know, we're, it's hard to actually resolve this. Our swaps are really good, um, and again, that's because it's 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 a native gate in our device, so it's very fast to do this. Um, and then you might, you know, with an eye to the future, look towards things that are like partially error correcting. So one thing you might care about is state leakage. So you want to have a two-level system, not a three-level system, at least naively. And so uh, we can, you know, generate these things theoretically and, and play them experimentally that uh, prevent leakage from spreading in our device. So if you accidentally leave your qubit subspace, you're not going to get harmed by this when you try to do a error correcting algorithm. Okay, but why are the errors the way they are? Um, so an informative thing is to basically do this again, but just interleave idle times and sweep the idle time. And what you'll find is, uh, as you increase the idle duration, you'll get these orange data points which fall on this curve that is essentially the gate time over the magnetic T2 star quantity squared. And essentially all of our two qubit gates are bounded by magnetic noise. And remember, you can make that better by essentially dynamical decoupling which is why this leakage control gate falls below the expected error for just idling, right? Or you can do an isotopic enrichment, which essentially is just gonna extend your T2 star and make uh, you know, a given gate duration uh, affect you less. Um, and ultimately, going faster will, will uh, mitigate these kinds of errors as well. Okay. And again, yeah, here's that, that leakage control there is actually overperforming the idle and our swap is you know, at the threshold. Um, yeah, so, uh, it, you know, there are other ways you, you could maybe 
design these gates to, to echo out noise, but it complicates the construction. It's an ongoing area of work because these are not easy to derive analytically. They're basically impossible to derive analytically um, unless you're you know, a genius. Um, uh, but I think the key takeaways here are that uh, semiconductor spin qubits, you know, they've been around a while, um, and they're now looking quite good, especially with uh, some of the advances in the technology from HRL laboratories with Sledge, as well as our control electronics, and, and our ability to incorporate things like machine learning to tuning these devices up. Um, and we're really getting qubit fidelities that are, that are approaching that of just, you know, state-of-the-art superconducting qubits in a much smaller form factor that, and leveraging that, that CMOS technology. Um, will exchange-only qubits be the, the, the quantum computer of the future? I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to stick around and find out. Um, if you're interested, uh, you should you know, reach out and talk to us. Um, we are hiring. A lot of people are hiring. Um, this is our main campus in Malibu, California. Um, does overlook the ocean. Uh, and my office happens to have an ocean view. Yours could, too. Uh, so with that, thanks. <laughs>